Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 250. Jay, that's the real 250, not the one we thought was 250 last week, which actually was 249. We're doing 250 over again. Well, it's so, it's so special, we'll do it twice. But Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm glad to be back, Derek. Yeah. Well, of course, this is Jay Pester Shelley, CEO of Zega Financial, my semi-permanent co-host. All right, Jay, I know we're going to do the big episode later in the year. Oh, it's probably coming up soon, our predictions for 24. We'll tell you how good or not so good we did in 23. Some of the big investment firms have targets now for, I guess this is year-end 24. You know, I don't know what that means during the year that it'll hit it or it's end of year. It's never really clear, right? They could say their target, and if I guess it gets there early, then it hit their target, right? It doesn't have to end the year. So what do we close at? Right around 4,600? Yeah. Yeah. 4,609. Uh, sorry, 4,604 as of Friday, December 8th. Okay. So I'll tell you who's really bearish, apparently. JP Morgan, 4,200. And I say JP Morgan because it this could be one analyst at JP Morgan. Uh, Morgan Stanley, 4,500. So they both have declines. UBS says the market's going to be exactly where it is uh, as it was yesterday or Friday, I guess. Uh, We're recording this late this weekend. We're recording it on Sunday. And then you go up to Capital Economics, 5,500, and BMO Deutsche Bank. Uh, Both of them are at 5,100. B of A at 5,000, Barclays 4,800, Goldman's 4,700, a few others in there. I I mean, I don't know. I think this, by the way, goes in the category of who cares? Who cares what they think? Because it doesn't really make a difference when it comes to individuals investing. Like nobody should look at this and say, I don't know, JP Morgan says 4,200. What do you do with this, Jay? I, I don't think anything. <laughs> it's it's like all predictions, right? You never, you know, they're all, the, I'm sure there's something pithy I could say about it, right? But they're like opinions, right? Everybody has one and they stink. I, I was going a different direction on that one, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes. But yeah, like, I mean, I yeah. look, JP Morgan, they, they, they <laughs> I'm laughing because we do seem to dig on JP Morgan quite a bit. Because they don't pay me anything in my checking account, which, by the way, I still haven't moved out of there. And I'm earning nothing on my cash. Thanks, J.P. Morgan. No wonder you're bearish. I know it's probably different people making those decisions. Uh, but, yeah, like, I, you know, Jamie Dimon has been th- – I'm, like, I'm not surprised. I don't think it's one analyst, Eric, right? I mean, think about what Jamie Dimon has been talking about, right? Sc- scaring the market, worried about 7% rates. Market's not prepared for this. The market can't handle what's happening here with interest rates. You know, and the, and the outlook here, he's he's just kind of consistently negative, at which which is odd, right? For 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 him to really continue to be on that side of uh, of caution, right? I mean, I feel like it's more cautious, right? But even the ones that are flat, like Wells Fargo, UBS, and I'll even call Morgan Stanley at 100 points lower, like they're still. I mean, I think they're probably reflecting, you know, their opinion that eventually we're going to pay the piper for our higher interest rates and the soft landing is out and it feels more like a hard landing, right? And, you know, to, to say the high of next year will be where we end this year, that's fairly bearish considering how infrequently that happens. So I I don't know, um, you know, I'm not going to change my investment thesis here, right? We're still generally markets go up. So we generally stay invested in equities, but we hedge in case these kind of things come through. I'll tell you at the beginning of last year, I think there were a lot of folks asking why we weren't hedging tighter, why we were even having exposure to the market. And our answer was, we generally want to be exposed to equities because generally they go up and we'll throw in a hedge to offset that risk. And I think that turned out to be you know, the right decision, the way things are looking here. I think people kind of forget the the beginning of the year. I um, it'd be great, Derek, if we had last year's predictions to show just how wrong. Uh, you know, I know we're going to get to our predictions, just how wrong the analysts can be when it comes to this, and that you should dim- dismiss it and count it as one thing of many things to consider when deciding how to invest. I mean, don't, don't you think that this also has a lot of recency bias? And 
It's easy. And well, there's normally we we'd say that. I will tell you as well, the spread on this 4200 to 5500. I mean, that's you could drive a truck through that spread. That's 1300 point difference between the lowest and the highest, at least listed here. But I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Are any of these banks or any of these investment firms, investment banks, are they telling their their banking wealth clients not to invest? Like, are they telling them? I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, are they changing their? Are they? Yeah, I mean, I I think the research department and the uh, uh, financial advisor department, the advisory, you know, are probably they talk, but they are not linked, right? So. Yeah, I mean, this isn't. This shouldn't really change how anybody's invested. I, I'm pretty. I'm fairly certain they're not changing somebody's plan because of a one year return. If anything, the FAs, financial advisors at these large firms, you know, prefer a five to ten year plan, right? Because it takes this kind of one year noise out of the mix, and uh, and you know that is something that I think you and I agree with. Have a longer term plan, right? Investor you know, what happens over the long term versus short term calling the market. So no, I would say no, I don't think they're going to be changing their investment strategies based on these, you know, the analyst prediction. So neither should you, right? Neither should anybody else. I, I did try and find the uh, the predictions. Uh, I, I can't find it. I'm not going to wait, spend too much time because we're live recording here. I will say though that I feel like a lot of times – uh, especially investors or, or even professionals, they sort of are still trying to fight the last battle. And the first full year of, of my career was 1994. And 1987 was less than seven full years. You know, so like beginning of 94, mid-94, you know, you're, it wasn't seven years until October. And I can tell you that a lot of people kept thinking, oh, you know, we're going to have a big, crash like we had in 87 it's coming and you kept you kept hearing that and you, me, you remember after 2008 2009 you know 2010 11 12 13 as the markets were recovering everyone said no no the double dip is coming the double dip is coming so i think sometimes the and i say recency bias but it's just whatever happened most recently is what investors are trying to prepare for like I guarantee you that people are going to f- be doing strategies that benefit from, you know, rates, uh, you know, the rates going up or something, or they're going to try and do strategies where they say, well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do, you know, gold or commodities and this stuff. I don't know. I just, I think it's tough and it, it's just, I don't think it's very helpful. To, to look at this stuff. It is interesting though. Like why, why is JP Morgan versus BMO and Deutsche Bank that different? I don't know. Anything else, Jay? D- different perspective there. I mean, I, I think we would just, I, I, I'm fairly certain nobody predicted a 21% gain, right? In 2023 in the S&P, right? It may, maybe Tom Lee did, right? He's the, the perma bull that we watched. Well, Tom, Tom Lee absolutely did. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, besides him, I don't think anybody else predicted this. So it just goes to show, like, you got to stick with your plan and move forward on this. You know, we've even talked to some clients recently that, you know, they are, they feel okay, right? The fear is not in, uh, in, in everybody's mind right now. Like, oh, the market's kind of shaking this off. And it, what's even more noteworthy is the clients that usually call us when things are getting a little dicey haven't called us. So I think it, I think it's um, it's interesting that you're right. Recency and the bias of what's happened most recently is going to impact people's opinion going forward. I mean, the market's up twelve percent from October twenty seventh. So we're talking like five six weeks for the S and P to be up twelve percent. That's a pretty strong run, uh, and we've seen all the fear come out of the market. So I'm not surprised that you know folks in general uh, have a little less fear than you would think. I'm sure there's going to be some tax harvesting stuff at the end of every year, right? We always see that impact. This year, however, I think it's probably wait till January, right? All right, let's push any, you know, gains that we have to take off till January and not take big gains in, you know, 2023 if they have them. But, you know, that might be the only thing that I would see, right? Like January might be a more interesting story uh, uh, than it usually is after this run-up that we've seen recently. 
you know, you mentioned tax loss harvesting and another reason why people might sell early is that if they thought there was going to be a major change and sometimes a negative change in the, in the tax rates, the way that Congress is sort of deadlock right now, there's, there's probably zero chance of a big tax bill, you know, a tax hike being passed. But it's a weird thing that if you, if you did see that happening, you might see investors selling gains to do it now versus waiting. But it, it's very unlikely that Congress, Congress can't do anything. They could barely, I don't even think they passed the a budget. They just keep, you know, doing continuing re- resolutions. But yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, yep. I think enough, enough said there, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to ask you about the VIX. And this is from Charlie Bellello on Twitter. He said, the VIX has fallen 43% over the last seven weeks from 21.71 to 12.35. It's the 16th largest seven-week decline in history. And, it, you know, some of this, when we think about declines, I mean, if the VIX spiked to 60 and then came down, it would be a bigger decline. But I just, I looked at his graph and according to his numbers, uh, week ending 5-8 five of, five, of 2020, that's the largest seven-week change. It was minus 57.6%. And the VIX uh, you know, came down to 28. 2016, minus 55%, came all the way down to 11.6. So I don't, you know, we haven't, we've done a little bit of work on the VIX. I haven't looked at the VIX like this, Jay. I don't know if you have, but I, I think we, this is not new for us where we've had a regime of higher volatility where volatility stays higher for longer, even though the markets are going up. And finally, it sort of breaks. VIX breaks. Markets are, you know, markets aren't going up necessarily any at a greater magnitude than they were before, but it just takes a little time. Um, what do you think about this, Jay? All right. So first off, measuring the VIX in periods of seven weeks at a time feels a little bit like cherry picking to me, right? I mean, uh, n- nobody really thinks of that. Like seven weeks, there's no relevance to that. I mean, is that cl- because the VIX is a 30-day and seven times? You no know, idea. I don't, like, why would you pick that, right? I mean, if it's... That, that's that's not – so first off, it seems random, right? There's no statistical relevance that I know of a seven-week period when it comes to the VIX. And the VIX moves way too quickly for seven weeks to be relevant, right? You want to tell me two or three-week moves, uh, you know, max a month, fine. Then at that point, maybe there's some relevance here. So first off, seems like kind of a rando, you know, period he was evaluating. The second thing when I look at this, like I – you're right. I would. I completely agree with you that uh, these periods of high VIX and periods of low VIX tend to last for a few years at a time. Um, so from, I would say, you know, early 2020 until just, let's just say as of October of this year, you know, that was a fairly, you know, that was a higher than average regime. Are we starting the next multi-year period? of lower VIX. I'm not sure, but geez, it's starting to feel like that with another week closing with a 12 handle on the VIX. Right. And, uh, so I don't, I don't think that it's, um, inappropriate to watch the VIX, right. Which the VIX is a, as a reminder, right. Representation of the premium of S and P options, right. The more expensive those options are, the higher the VIX is generally, the VIX is higher and those options are higher due to fear because people are buying puts as uh, as a means of protection in, in case there's a quick down move. Um, so it doesn't always mean that. When I, when I look at the periods on this chart, right, obviously the number one that occurred in May, on May 8th, 2020, yeah, you go back six weeks from, seven weeks from there, that was right in the middle of the pandemic. So clearly, you know, that was like, wow, it really dropped. But by the way, it only went down to 28. Right. So you and I both know that fast forward a little farther, it still could go lower from there. Right. So and it it clearly does. Right. A 28 VIX is still high, ladies and gentlemen. Right. That is still a high level. So, again, I I don't 
it's it's look it looks great like the the what he does is after he looks at this he then says here's the one month three month six month nine month one year three year performance after that i mean to look at a three year performance after the fix drop you know in a seven week period is really i i don't i don't think that's that's very usable a one month maybe and when i look at the change in the one month like remember what this means right a vix dropping says you shouldn't expect a lot of move either way either up or down, right? And as I'm looking at these numbers, there's one scenario, which again was after the pandemic where the VIX was up 8% in a month after this drop occurred. There's another example uh, after 98, right? Where the VIX, where the market was up 5%. But the rest of these are all, you know, less than 5% move in a month. And I think you and I would categorize a move of less than 5% as fairly ordinary volatility, and fairly ordinary movements. I do see a, a negative six here on uh, 20, 2007. And that that one was the beginning of, of a pretty bad crisis. So let's put that one in, in, the, in the exception category. So generally, what this tells me in the one month evaluation, regardless of the period of the drop of the VIX, generally, when I look at this, what it tells me is, hey, markets are fairly muted a month later. And you and I would say, yeah, that's exactly what the VIX is telling us. There should be a muted move in the market a month later, but you always have your exceptions. That's it. That one, and uh, you, you picked up on that. Uh, so it's 10.5 of 07, had a 43.6% decline uh, over the seven weeks of the VIX index. It rested or came down to 169 as you said, I mean, that was before it was January, end of January is when we start to see some declines. There's another was that, one in there. Was that when Bear Stearns started to, I think that's when E-Trade first started showing the cracks in their HELOC business. And then I think Bear Stearns was starting to show some cracks in late 07, right? Before, of course, we all know what happened in 08 with the Great Recession, right? So I'm, it could be that, you know, this was kind of that calm before that storm in that particular instance. Well, look at the no, look at number nineteen down. So nineteen of twenty, that was oh, in May yeah. May of two thousand eight. Another one where it declined forty one percent, declined all the way to eighteen point two. If if we knew nothing else, we would say, you know what, it must have spiked and came back down. You know, people were a little more easy with things. Spiked again, came back down. As we know that you know markets really deteriorated. I mean, early, based upon the VIX, you would say the VIX caught it, but then it it gave an all all clear a little bit too too soon there. Too soon. If, if this is what it's telling us as an all clear, I don't even know. Should we be considering this as an all clear again? That was a no. VIX of sixteen point nine. That's not an all clear in your book and my book. That's average. And by the way, when is it ever at its average? It never is. <laughs> well, if, right. It moves every day, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's never at its average. When has the VIX ever been at its long-term average, you know? So, um, all right. So I like, I like how Charlie puts out a lot of this stuff. So, but you're not a fan of this I appreciate one. him trying. I'm going to say this as you don't get fooled by this. All right. I want to switch uh, briefly and then we, we want to talk through some misconceptions we'll call it with how synthetic long with covered call strategies work um, but i want to i want to mention the the us labor force participation rate and this is uh this is 25 to 54 yeah so this is a kind of the prime working age you're still in there Derek. i am thank you very much i believe you yeah. are too right I am. I am. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're very close in age. So <laughs> the, uh, no, we are actually, we are very, very I'm not kidding. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a year. I don't even think it is. I don't think so. So the reason I bring this up is so labor force participation is basically, if you think about the size of the labor force and then the amount of people who are working or are looking for work, into that size of the available labor force. That's the simplest way I can sort of uh, define it for somebody. And the labor force participation rate prior to the pandemic 
was over, at least for prime working age, was over 83%. Pretty good. And I could tell you, if you could see this chart, it had been coming down, 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 um, you know, 07, 08. It kept going down. It actually got down to only about 80% and then rally back up. You have the pandemic, the government do the forced shutdowns, and it just craters. Uh, it goes back to, it goes all the way below 80%. So you want more labor force participation. It's been recovering, uh, but the, the last print, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of a statistical, uh, I don't know if it's too impactful, but I just thought it was noticeable, Jay, that it, it sort of drew back, uh, meaning that. So to review the definition here, right, it's, it's the percentage of people in this age range that are working or are actively looking for work, correct? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so you're right. The last two prints, it's pulled back like about a half a percent. While it, it was in a pretty good incline from let's call it the mid, you know, 2020 era up until just maybe two months ago, right? It's been kind yeah. of moving up, 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 up. There's, you know, like all things, there's a little dip here and there, but it's been pretty steep increase. And I don't know if this is, you know, everyone's looking for cracks in the labor market. They keep looking for, oh, this is the first sign. That's the first sign. Remember we talked a couple of weeks ago about when you see a moving, a nine month moving average, whatever the heck we were talking about, ticks above the low of the last three months. I, I'm making this up. I don't remember what it was. You know, oh, that's it. That's the, the crack in the labor market. Labor is the last thing to go. But if you were looking for cracks, I would say, all right, I, this isn't really significant, but it's interesting. And let's see if this continues. Yeah. You know, when I look at, you know, let's say 07 all the way down to, let's say 2015, right? That, like you said, that was a decline. We went from 83 all the way down to maybe 81. I, you know, we weren't feeling cracks at that point, right? Even though labor force already participation cracked. rate. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it was over. The crack was over. But like, but it wasn't a problem once we got out of it in 2010. Right, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I mean, seemed all okay. Like, I, I'm. This is too. I, I, listen, I appreciate you bringing it up as maybe a first hint of it. And we've definitely seen others that have said, "Oh, when this, you get this ch rate change in the amount of, uh, you know, the, the workforce, the unemployment rate. That's it. You know, that's. I think I was making fun of the woman that had a rule. What was the rule? So this is the rule. Right. Whatever you and your rule. Um, we'll see. You know, but I don't know, like I'm, I, this is not concerning yet to me. And this always feels like a little, you know, rear view mirror, you know, and kind of fitting it to match. But, you know, you're more of the professor of economics than I am, you know, when I think about what's going on with this. As I said, it's, it's not significant yet, but it's interesting. And I will tell you too, that part of the reason why the labor force participation rate may have, uh, stayed lower for longer is, I don't know if you remember, but they extended unemployment benefits by quite a lot. A long, you, you could stay on unemployment for a long time. So I don't know if, um, you know, if they answered the call and they said, are you looking for work? And somebody said, no, you know, whether they, they dropped out of the, the labor force participation. So uh, the other reason why this could be dropping is you could have new people entering the 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 uh, workforce or the the labor force the available labor force right those and that could be immigration that could be people aging into it um you know i don't know if you have a massive amount of people just turning 25 versus you know the the previous ones that dropped off that were turning 55 but those are all things that can impact this as well. But I don't know. thought it was interesting because- How did I, all the strikes impact this, right? How do they count all the striking that was going on? Because I feel like that's a little bit of a monkey wrench in all of this potentially as well. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's right. Because if, if you're on strike, you're not necessarily looking for another job. And you might still be being paid because don't the unions have, uh, uh, you know, the dues are supposed to, to, to sort of, they get payments, right? While they're on strike for a certain yeah. amount of time. 
Yeah, that's kind of why you pay into the union, right? So that if you do have to strike, you've got some, you know, some backup built in. Yeah. I'm looking at something right now, if I can find the answer. Um, I, th- so, I think there were, and, and oh, if you got something, go ahead, if you got it. Well, so the government counts workers who go on strike as employed, but not at work. That means the strikers should not have a direct effect on an unemployment rate. But the impact on strikes can be seen in a monthly jobs report, separate count of payroll jobs. So there you go. Probably productivity also, right? Probably hits that too. Strikes are not very productive when they're striking, right? (laughs) No, strikes aren't great. They're not great. And it's uh, because you have the productivity. You also have the, the lost opportunity for the companies and their products. And typically, once a strike is resolved, it might result in worse um, cost and, you know, structures for a lot of those companies as well. And yeah. simple economics says that strikes or unions or a lot of this stuff, it might help the workers get more money, but it actually might cost some jobs in the long run because if costs of employment go up, they might not have as much money to to employ as many people or employ more. So yeah, I mean that that happened this this time around, right? With the auto workers, right? There were a decent amount of layoffs associated with all of this, but people that stayed ended up having an increase. So um, that's that's kind of exactly what happened, right? So they got less people working, companies are paying more, probably a little less productive. So it's probably generally inflationary. You know. Did you see? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we want to talk about some options, uh, synthetics, and covered calls. Uh, but it seems like Elon Musk is all of a sudden involved in Danish strikes or Swedish strikes, and apparently some of the unions over there they'll they'll strike in support of one another, even though they're unrelated industries. So I think if I read this right, the postal workers, I believe in Sweden. I hope I think I have that right. Uh, went on strike in sympathy of like the whatever, you know, mechanics union or something like that. And by them going on strike, they couldn't deliver plates. So they couldn't get their cars, even the ones that were finished off the line. That's how I read it. So it's just a, if you're, if you're pure sideshow and uh, it will be interesting to see how Elon deals with, with all these. So I don't know if you saw anything about that. I, I didn't see that one, but it doesn't surprise me, right? Yeah, I like that you called it sideshow, right? There's always a different level of entertainment going on um, uh, with uh, disruptive people like Elon Musk. I, I would say, gosh, but isn't Sweden like one of the happiest countries on earth? Isn't it like, doesn't it like uh, you know, I don't know. One Is of it? the happiest countries. I don't know why I had to add the on earth. There's no countries on other planets. So I, I, I mean, I think it's one of those uh, – I don't know, Derek. I'm glad we're not running a business in Sweden. I mean, I wouldn't mind visiting, but I'm not sure I would want to run a business there. Anybody who's got a business in Sweden, we'd love to hear from you. Just email Derek. We do have uh, Swedish listeners. You can check in with me at Derek.Moore at ZegaFinancial.com. That's uh, D-E-R-E-K dot M-O-O-R-E at Zega Financial, which is Z as in Zebra, E as in Eddie, G as in George, A as in Apple. Financial's up to you to spell correctly dot com. All right. Uh, I look forward to that. Uh, uh, those comments and uh, from our Swedish listeners, we do have some there. We actually had a Morocco uh, for somebody apparently, or either using a VPN. We had a Morocco listener show up last week, so welcome to uh, Morocco. That's yeah. great. Yeah, it's fantastic. All right, all right. I want to get to synthetics, and I don't want to scare anybody, but I'm going to start off the discussion. It's a scary this word. Way. No, it is. It is. When you think about I'm going to start with you when you buy a stock. When you just buy 100 shares of stock and you think about the profit and loss characteristics of that stock, and if you had a profit and loss graph, what would you see? Well, if you buy a stock, you know it can go to zero. That's the lowest it can go. Of course, commodities can go negative. We saw that with oil. But stocks can go to zero. So your max loss is whatever you buy it at down to zero. Your max gain is infinity. Although, I don't know about you, Jay, very few times I bought a stock and it went to infinity. But that's really your, your, your profile. So when you think about that profile, Jay, I mean, the, the, all you need to do is you need to say, okay, 
I want those same characteristics, but I want to do it with options. And we say it that way, Jay, I think it, it sort of demystifies it or it begins to, to make it a little less scary. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to, if, if the term synthetics, right, it represents kind of you're synthesizing or you're replicating the same exposure. And you're right, Derek, when you have long stock, if the stock goes up a point, you make a point times every share you own. If stock goes down a point, you lose a point for every share you own. Same, you would want that same characteristics in an options build. So I think that's a nice way to kind of set the stage here. Like, is there a way with options to make it feel like when the stock goes up a point, you go up a point. When the stock goes down a point, you go down a point, right? That to me would be, you know, a way of replicating the long stock position, right? Um, I mean, I think that's really what you're what you're trying to express. And if you could keep it in that perspective, is there a way with options to make it, you know, to experience a gain when the stock moves one for one, up or down uh, with options? That that's that would be the case. And I would say there absolutely is. Anybody that's ever taken a seven or the 65, you learn about, they teach you about synthetics because there is absolutely an investment case for using synthetics uh, many times. And, uh, you know, so that word shouldn't intimidate anybody. Just synthetic means feels like you're long stock, but we did it with options. The other part of this too is when, and maybe we'll, we can describe a, an example, but uh, the other part of this is when you're buying a stock, you've got to uh, really take up all your cash. You have to spend your cash to buy that stock. When you're using options, you're using less cash. Sometimes it's sort of no cost, and it doesn't mean no risk, certainly. But to me, I mean, th- this starts off with the the case of okay, instead of using all the cash, we can have it invested in something like treasuries. But Jay, if I, if I just wanted to replicate long stock, why don't you give us a real simple example? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's take stock XYZ, our favorite stock. Great and stock. And I'm a strong yeah. buyer, strong buy on that one, Jay. Strong, but probably maybe one of the funds we put out, we should use XYZ. Maybe we'll put XYZ Y at the end of it. Anyway. Oh boy. But let's not go down. Oh boy. I got an oh boy already out of Derek. You can't. Um, you can't okay. I, <laughs> by the way, just, just let me state. So for anybody who's listening who who maybe is like, why can't they talk about certain things? I'm gonna use somebody else's example because that's safer. And there are different regulations and requirements in, in our industry. And Jay, I remember that there was a, a uh, it was a manager of a, a value ETF who was on a podcast, and they were asking him questions about it. And he said, "I'm not sure I can even confirm or deny that I am the manager of the podcast. I think I can confirm its <laughs> existence, but I don't." And they just they didn't get it. He's like, "I don't. I'm not trying to be you know coy with you guys, but like it sounds crazy, but that's that's how it works. So how's that, Jay?" And I, yeah, that's good. I mean, listen, if he was listed in the prospectus, he could have confirmed it, right? So that's that's all you can always, you can always repeat what is in the prospectus, right? But anyway, so now we're uh, let's 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 move to stock X Y Z or yeah. fund X Y Z. Who knows? Stock. Uh, let's say it's trading. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to pick a non uh, a price we don't usually pick. I'm going to say uh, thirty five dollars. Stock X Y Z is trading at. If I wanted to. Uh, let's let's talk about the characteristics of options alongside with this. If I want to participate in the upside movement of stock uh, XYZ that's trading at 35, I would want to own a call. I think everybody understands the way calls work, uh, which, you know, by having the right to buy the stock at a certain price, as the stock goes up, generally your option increases as well, right? With the downside of time decay. And I'll hit on that in a moment. So, the, the, the upside capture of a stock can be achieved by owning a call. We say long a call, right? That means you own the call. But you got this pesky little time decay aspect to it, right? Anybody that's ever traded options, uh, has we have all learned the lesson, including Derek and I, and we, we always watch for this. We've all learned the lesson of you might be right on direction, but your option has this time decay component, right? The future value or the the speculative nature of the cost of that call. And you may not actually make money even though the stock went up, right? This happens usually around earnings. Somebody decides to buy a call in advance of earnings 
and then the stock moves up, but only a little bit, and you end up losing money on that long call, even though the stock went up. So that's this little, I'm going to call this pesky time decay associated with a long call needs to be offset somehow. And so the way that we offset that is we sell a put at the same time at the same strikes. And that allows you to earn the time decay um, while still having a bullish exposure, right? A short put is bullish. A long call is bullish. You have two bullish positions on, and that would give you bullish exposure in a way that we would say will move price, dollar for dollar with the underlying stock. So back to XYZ at 35, I would buy a long 35 call. I would sell uh, a 35 put. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to cost me. You know, who knows on the, the price of the options. But the result is uh, it should generally be pretty flat. shouldn't cost you very much to do that from a cash perspective. There is a margin concern, but because you have full stock exposure. But when you're long a call and short a put, you're going to make dollar for dollar or lose dollar for dollar along with the stock. And you've probably used significantly less capital and it allows you to invest in, like you said, in treasuries with the excess capital or allows you just, you know, keep it in cash, right? Like keep it, keep some powder dry. Just realize that for each contract that you purchased uh, with this synthetic, meaning long call, short put, um, you are, you have the exposure of a hundred shares of stock, right? So every dollar that the stock moves, XYZ moves, you're going to make or lose a hundred dollars. It's generally the way synthetics are constructed. And um, I, I'll pause there, Derek, in case you want to add to it. But I think we then we could go maybe like, why would you even bother going through this whole option thing, right? Why would you use synthetics instead of just owning the stock? And I think you touched on it briefly. But anything you want to add to the construction of that long 35 short, long 35 call, short 35 put? I think it's important to just say again that it's it's not – um, you didn't in, implicitly, explicitly say it, but you kind of implied uh, there's no leverage. You're not taking leverage when you use a, you know, a single contract for every 100 shares. It's the same thing really as, as owning the, the 100 shares with some, some just different nuances. And the other thing is you mentioned also that it's probably you know, the price to buy the call and to sell the put depending upon which strikes and things like that, it's going to be fairly close. It might wind up being a small debit, maybe a small credit, but you have all this cash in the account as well. And that cash can be invested in treasury bills. Right now, treasury bills are getting around 5%. So right away, if you don't have a, a div, let's say this stock doesn't really pay a dividend or doesn't pay a dividend equal to, uh, you know, to, to the treasury rate, Okay, well now now you sort of have this base, and then you you build this on top of the the base. So, uh, but I think I think it it just it's important to note that synthetics doesn't equal leverage. You could leverage this position by doing this twice, and then you'd be two to one, two to one on the upside, minus two times on the downside. So, I think that that that's really a, I think an important point to make here, Jay. Yep, it is. And and I you touched on some other factors like dividends and interest rates. They will impact the cost of uh, synthetic. And I, I think we'd really we'd probably lose a lot of folks if we talked about the cost to carry and why a put is lower in a higher interest rate environment versus we might lose our, our new listener from Morocco if we do that. So we'll we'll stay away yeah, from that. I, yes. I, 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 I might hang up if we did that. So, uh, yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about why. Why would you do such a thing, right? Um, generally speaking, I think it's you, you hit on the dividend piece. This isn't usually advantageous to do when you have a high-paying dividend uh, stock, um, especially one that's not paying what the uh, that's paying more than the treasury, right? You'd rather own the stock and chew up your cash, but it's a better. You actually will earn, you could potentially earn more of a payout because of the dividend there. Um, a lot of folks use it because it just gives you more utility, um, especially uh, if you want to uh, use uh, this in an IRA where you don't have regular margin, uh, uh, the ability to borrow a margin, right? I think we have a handful of clients that we do this for today where they, you know, want to do a couple things and they want to add, you know, some extra exposure, but yet in an IRA, they're kind of limited to do things like overriding a position with options, right? From buying power released from long stock. So instead you can use a synthetic 
create your exact same exposure that we just talked about, still feels like you're long 100 shares of XYZ, but you've got all this free cash in case you wanted to do something like sell options for income over the top of it, right? With credit spreads, that's a whole probably another detailed conversation. Or, uh, you know, or just utilize to maybe have exposure to a few other uh, a few other positions that maybe, you know, in a cash type account, you wouldn't have the ability to do it. So it really is a useful tool, uh, especially in a tax deferred account where you don't have margin being released. There's also the benefit of, you know, uh, you know, you don't have as much of a tax concern in, you know, an IRA or a qualified account um, because options do expire, right? These will generate, you know, taxable events in a taxable account. So options do expire, um, you versus holding stock that you never have to sell. Um, but that is one use case, right? Where you want to like have a little exposure and say, geez, I wish I, I'd like to buy some Microsoft and Google. Oops, I said those names. I'd like to buy some tech stocks and, uh, but I don't, you know, necessarily have enough cash to do it. Using synthetics can help you create that exposure. Now in that case, you're leveraged, right? We would say you, you, you have an implied leverage because you have more notional exposure, but Maybe you're okay with that, right? Maybe that's fine for you. Maybe that's what you're trying to achieve in an IRA uh, uh, to, you know, add some strategies or add some diversification to a portfolio. What if you wanted to pay for a hedge, right? Well, I only have my long stock in my IRA and I can't, you know, buy protection on it. Great. Don't worry about it. Sell the stock, create the synthetic. Now you have the cash available to even buy some protection. So there's, there's a lot of use cases on where synthetics come into play. It's just not to do it, you know, to be the to be a smart guy and like, look, I synthetically did it. Now there's some real use cases and benefits of freeing up cash when you have positions. I think it's worth noting that uh, we use the term notion a lot. Maybe it's, it's helpful. Uh, I'll just go through what that means. When we say notional exposure. If you own a hundred shares of XYZ at 35, you own $3,500 worth of exposure. So if you own an option contract, you don't own shares, but you control uh, $3,500 of, of notional exposure. So you say notionally I'm long the stock, but I'm not, I, I don't actually own the stock. So whenever we say notional, it's just for a, a little bit of money, uh, you're using options to notionally create exposure. So, all right, Jay, the other part of this is we have synthetic long stock, which as we've said is long a call, short a put, usually the same strike or thereabouts. And then we want to add a, a short call to it. I think, first of all, it's, it's helpful to just maybe relate to people. Like, what a, when you sell a call, what's the benefit? What are you giving up? What are you hoping to accomplish there? Yeah, so th- this is uh, like options 101. The first strategy everybody learns is covered calls, right? Long stock with a short call over the top of it. Let's start with that as the description to not confuse anybody. But everybody's heard, if you've ever, you know, even dabbled in options or heard about options, selling covered calls is the very first strategy that you learn about even before buying a put for protection and hedging, right? Selling covered calls. So when you're selling a call, you are getting paid premium in exchange for giving up some upside. And why why would you possibly do that, right? Why would you possibly give up some upside? Well, maybe you want to use that long stock as collateral to generate income when the underlying uh, stock doesn't have a dividend. So back to XYZ, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, long at $35 because that's where it's trading and I sell a 40 strike call for a dollar, I've just generated a dollar of premium, which I'm going to keep that dollar. I sell that option, but I give up any upside participation in XYZ past 40. So the the bias that you should have when you're running a covered call strategy is you still want it to go up because uh, you're fine. You could still make money between 35 to 40. You actually don't really want it to go down because you have all the downside exposure, right? When you have a covered call, the short call only gives you a little bit of cushion by the amount of uh, income you made by selling that you know call for a dollar. But you have from 35 all the way down to zero on the risk. And so I think everybody should remember a covered call strategy is actually a bullish strategy. I like to say a bullish to neutral strategy because, uh, uh, you know, you don't have your stock called away when it doesn't go through the strike. And we can talk more about that in a minute. But in that scenario where you're long at 35 and you sell a 40 strike call for a dollar, let's say you do that four times a year. You sell that each quarter. 
you could throughout the year potentially generate four dollars of income on top of your third long 35 stock and four bucks out of 35 is a nice little premium right that's over 10 percent uh, uh of what of of the of the underlying stock price and so in that scenario the downside besides the stock dropping is if the stock really ran higher past 40 you stop making money at 40 but it's okay. You took the stock from 35 to 40 and you got a little bit of premium, but you always have to be willing to understand that you're not going to participate in all the gains of the stock. And so, you know, there's plenty of stocks that, you know, move slowly and sideways and they don't pay as much premium and other stocks that are, uh, have a high amount of volatility and have big moves. They have more volatility and you'll get more income from those, right? So the more uh, volatile the stock, the more juice there is in the options, we like to say, but there's a lot that goes into that juice. The premium is just more. So that's generally what a covered call is. Now, remember, I told you a synthetic is just the same as being long stock. So you can run this strategy the exact same way, but using the synthetic stock in that scenario. So the long call and short put, let's say that's out for a year, you buy one year strikes, you can sell quarterly calls or even less often if you want against that long call. And that long call that you have actually acts as kind of helps reduce the margin requirement and, uh, uh, you know, acts as collateral or the offsetting position for that short call. So you can run a covered call strategy, but using synthetic instead of actual stock. We call those synthetic covered calls. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do that. And But I'll pause right there, Derek, to see if you want to add anything that I might have missed as one of the talking points on the covered call aspect of the strategy. Yeah, I mean, the, the synthetics kind of might confuse or it might, but take out synthetics. If you buy a stock and sell a call, it's a covered call. And as you said, I mean, a, a synthetic position is just a synthetically creating long stock ownership. I think the other thing to mention too is that someone who's doing this should not be unhappy if they underperform the underlying because the underlying has gone up. Like you, you giving something up, as you said, you're taking in a bunch of premium and you're already, you're, you know what you're signed up for. If you're selling covered calls and granted, you can roll them, you could do some adjustments, but like, as you said, I mean, if the stock goes up, great, great. Cause you get, you get a little upside, but I think, you know, sometimes people look at this and say, well, you know, why don't I just own the stock? But And if they want unlimited upside and they want to match dollar for dollar the participation of the underlying, just buy the underlying. That's what you should do. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I don't, like covered call investors are, are doing the covered call because it generates income, right? It helps you kind of harvest the yield out of the option chain. That's a weird thing to say. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. It helps you generate income that you might not have otherwise got. And you're forfeiting some upside for that. If your goal is to outperform the stock, this is not the right option strategy for that, right? Very rarely does a covered call strategy over the long term outperform the underlying stock. It just doesn't. Because stocks don't always move in a nice, predictable upward trend in an upward manner. Stocks can be spazzy, right? Stocks can look like an EKG from time to time. So and when those when that happens, you know, the option dynamics of, look, you've given up the upside and you got paid for that, right? Remember, you got premium for giving up the upside. So it's, 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 if your expectation is that a covered call strategy will outperform the underlying stock that you're running it on, then you, you're running the wrong strategy, right? Like that's not going to happen. Yes, maybe in a, a in a slow down moving market over time, you know, and a stock's dropping, 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 you may drop less in that covered call strategy. But as I said before, you don't, you really, you're still losing money in that scenario. You're just losing a little less. It's not the right strategy. Usually you, you don't do the cover call strategy because you're bearish on the stock. Then you're in the wrong strategy if that's your outlook, right? There's different option tactics. No, I mean, you, it's, it's high current income. I mean, that's, that's what you want. I mean, it's, it's higher income. Um, some, if, some, you know, if you're buying uh, an exchange-traded fund and it would be higher dividends, 
But I mean, that's what you're prioritizing. Yeah. You want it's income. income. It's you, you're, you're doing the cover call because you want income. Thank you. End of sentence, period. Yep. All right. So I think to summarize this, it's, it sounds scary. It's not that scary. It's just, I go back to my initial point. If you buy a stock, what's the attributes of it? It's unlimited gain. It is lost down to zero. If you own a stock and you sell a covered call, what is it? It's risk down to zero and it's limited gain up to the, the strike price of the call that was sold. You start to use some, some interesting language with, uh, with synthetics. It's the same thing. Buying a call, selling a put, selling another call, which is covered against that call. It's actually a, forms a spread. It's essentially the same thing. It's, it's synthetically long stock short a covered call against your synthetic position. And I think the goal here of somebody doing that, as you said, period, end of sentence, it's, it's income. It's income. So, all right, Jay, I think we've done a, <laughs> I think we did a pretty good job of, of demystifying that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions about what that is. And, um, and again, you're, if your goal is to outperform the stock, that's we have different strategies yep. for that. If your goal is to to match the performance of a market or a stock, that's different a different strategy. strategy. Absolutely. This is income. And I would so. say for anybody that's interested in learning more about synthetics, I'll give you just a little nugget that you can search because there are other benefits of synthetics. Look up what a jelly roll is. It's it's not a donut, it's not a pastry. Look up what a jelly roll is with synthetics, and you'll start to see some other advantages of you know, taking profit and cashing in on profits without losing any exposure. There's a whole different discussion around the utility of a synthetic. We didn't get into it, but look on Investopedia and, uh, or any other site that you like to get options info on, look up Jelly Roll with synthetics. You'll find it amazing. Well, maybe in a future episode, we'll do a little bit on yeah, Jelly Rolls. Yeah, if we, could, if we could, you know, do do math in a very visual way and show people, you know, the dynamics of rolling, rolling, uh, rolling up strikes, it'll be very interesting. All right, Jay. Uh, since the NFL, uh, the New York Giants, the Arizona Cardinals, the New York Jets, all the, the teams are – really should just be losing. I know you've probably been catching up on uh, movies and TV. Anything you have for us this week that we should be uh, So should be I think I mentioned, uh, I've, been, I've been watching Fargo. I think I mentioned on a previous episode that I'll be watching that. I've been, I've been, yeah, I've been on my list so look, far. Hey, yeah, all good so, so far? So good. Um, you know what I watch? You know, like you stumble upon like an old show and you go, wow, I loved watching that in the, I'm going to say 80s. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I remember this show. I oh, loved okay, it. Wow. yeah. Tell me more. You, Somebody now, now has I'm interested. one out there. I want to go see it. So I watched uh, uh, the pilot for Moonlighting with Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis. So that's probably bringing back some memories. Wow. And you know, TV shows have come a long way. That show, which was very entertaining and fun to watch, uh, I found like I think my wife and I fell asleep twice watching. I was like, wow. And we were. It was. It was certainly funny. Bruce Willis was great. Right in the show, but we we watched an episode of Moonlighting. I think uh, you know. I guess you don't ever. This I'm probably exaggerating this, right? But don't ever want to meet your heroes. Like watching, you know, how they used to make shows. They're just so much slower than what they're doing today. Um, my brother recently just kind of finally finished watching The Sopranos. Right? I know, like that's a long time ago, which I thought, and I still do think, one of the greatest shows ever made. Um, he was like, it was a little slow. I'm like, you got to remember back, you know, in the early 2000s, right? Like even like, I think 98 was the first season. I could be wrong about that. It was like, look, like that was so unique at that time. So I guess I would, I, my recommendation is, you know, remember the greatness of your old shows. You don't have to go back and watch them unless you're tired and then, or you're trying to sleep because they'll probably put you to sleep, to sleep. Moonlighting was such a big show at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Like Bruce Willis just career took off. Sybil Shepherd was already known, but Bruce Willis, I mean, just launched his career. Yes. You know what that reminds me of too? I still remember the theme song at the beginning. Like there's no more theme songs. Remember like, you know, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley. Cheers. You know, the theme song. On, right? The opening Friends. credits. Yeah. Great theme songs. Now they don't even waste the time. Everyone skips to go them. Through. 
the, the song. You know? Skip. Skip. Everyone just skips right. it. Yeah. All right. I uh, I'm trying to remember what I I recently had some travel and I I was thinking of what I was watching. I felt like I, I assigned remember. you to watch something. Oh on the trip yeah, <laughs> that that stupid movie. You that finally you made me watched watch. it. The the GameStop movie. The money. Yeah, I watched it, Jay. Yep. It was it was entertaining, I guess. Um, you know, I, I still don't. I don't think it was great. I I will. I'm going to do this though. I'm going to go back and watch Deep Value Kitty's original assessment of because uh, I did find it. It's like an hour long. His original one, what he thought GameStop, you know, the 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 financials could be, what their cash flow would be, and I want to see whether any of it ever came true. So that's that's one of my. Uh, I'm going to hate watching that. Watch actually. it, watch it out of spite. How's that? Yeah, yeah. that is. Yeah. I, I, look, it was. Okay. I told you it'd be was- entertaining. I knew that the market commentary would be annoying to you, right? And uh, but but that's okay. I'm glad. I'm glad you watched it. My my only comment, if you haven't seen the movie uh, yet, then uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler here. Um, the only thing I thought was, you know, funny. The woman who was trading options is the only one at the end of it that ended up like losing everything, right? So there's a little bit of a warning in there with options on GameStop because those were some wild option trades. I mean, it sort of breaks your heart to hear how some of these people were up and then they weren't up, you know, and that was life-changing money probably. So you traded some of that, didn't you? You were in there with AMC, GameStop, Hertz. Did you trade Hertz? Uh, I think a couple of us traded, uh, I traded GameStop and AMC. I shorted, <laughs> don't do this at home, folks. I shorted calls. A lot of juice. When it was near the high. And I, yeah, and I, sh- it was so far out of the money. It was ridiculously out of the money and they still had worth. They still had a lot of premium. And I remember TD, the, the way they were doing it, they were doing a, a value at risk to, to assess how much margin to hold. Not so in other words, you might have cash available to trade it, but you actually needed more because they, they were valuing, they were sort of their risk department, but yeah. Like if it got cut in half, can you cover right? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, this is probably like 0.000 something of my net worth. Like that's how little of this I was doing just to be clear. It was just, it was a home game, right? It was like visiting the tables at your, uh, you know, to take a swing at something that just, you know, throw a little money at it. it. Every once in a while, you see something to say, this is probably the easiest money you can ever make. And uh, yeah, it, it was easy because <laughs> we saw, it, we, we just saw it and we're like, this is, this is free money. I'm just going to take this. But it, it was when I don't just a little bit. The only show I'll, I'll mention, Jay, real quick is, uh, uh, I'm thinking about rewatching the show Dark on Netflix. Ah. It's uh, uh, is that a foreign it is a language, complex right? that's translated. Well, it is. It's German, but it, they actually do a pretty good uh, job with the overdub. And a lot of times when there's overdubs, it loses some of the background. They did a really good job. Like you, you really don't know that it's not in English and. Uh, so I enjoyed it. I'm gonna. I might rewatch that, but I, I'd recommend that to people. It's got some time travel involved in it, multiple dimensions. It's very, very complex. So uh, I don't know if you've seen that yet, Jay. Have you? First season I watched. All right. Well, maybe you'll get maybe you'll get going on the the other ones. So, all right. That's it, Jay. Uh, that's it for us for this week. Next week we'll come back and talk about. Uh, reverse gamma jelly rolls and uh, all sorts of things. Well, we, you know, we can touch on, maybe we'll touch on the jelly roll at, a, at another meeting. By the way, oh, real quick. I did find, I'll save this when we do our predictions, but I found the the year-end 2023 predictions for all oh, the, the investment okay. firms. And I'll just, I'll, te- I'll tease a couple of them. UBS, 3,900. Morgan Stanley, 3,900. Capital Economics thirty eight hundred. They were they were what fifty five hundred for twenty. Yeah, they're the most bullish this year. Yeah, yeah. BlackRock thirty nine hundred. Goldman four thousand. HSBC four thousand. Credit Suisse forty fifty. Credit Suisse isn't around anymore. So J P Morgan forty two hundred. 
Wait, same level they're predicting for next year. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, Deutsche Bank was 4,500. Deutsche Bank, give it to Deutsche Bank, man. 4,500. They're, they're right close. in the neighborhood right now. Um, so anyway, we'll save that for when we do our prediction show. But I did find it, and I thought that was pretty interesting. So I figured I'd, I'd mention that real quick. Another shout out to Tommy Cutlets. Tommy Cutlets. There you go. See ya. See ya.